welcome back to my knitting podcast, Yarn to Table. I'm very excited to be here with you today. First of all, I just want to give a huge warm welcome to all of my new subscribers, as well as anyone who is watching me for the first time. Slowly but surely, I have seen that you are out there watching, and I just want to say I appreciate every single one of you, every comment you leave, every thumbs up you give if you subscribe. I now have a new group on Ravelry for the podcast, which I think would be a great way to get our community kind of going. One of the great things about connecting there instead of just in the comments here on YouTube is that we can all check out each other's projects and stashes and other awesome knitting related things. And uh, so I think it would be fantastic if you are interested, please join. I will leave the link to the group directly in the down bar. You can also search for it. It's just Yarn to Table Podcast. Um, so brand new group there, hoping that will slowly but surely start to grow as well. And um, yeah, I just wanna say thank you so much for watching me and spreading the word if you've been spreading the word. So enough, enough about that. <laughs> um, let's get into some of the nitty goodness. So as you know, um, probably, if you've seen before, you can find me on Ravelry and Instagram as Celeste Full, and you'll find all kinds of information about any of the projects that I talk about there on my Ravelry projects page, but you can also feel free to ask any specific questions you may have here in the comments. Don't worry about asking a question that you could find for yourself on Ravelry. I don't mind at all. Um, so after my little Instagram and Ravelry plug, I usually get into talking about finished objects. And the thing is that this week, I don't have any finished objects, um, which is not for lack of knitting my little fingers to the bone. Um, it actually has to do with a very severe case of sweater monogamy <laughs> that has come over me in the last week. So if you watched last week, you know that there were two sweaters kind of vying for my, my heart and my attention. Um, one of them is the Miette that I'm knitting for my friend's birthday as part of the Andy Sat Along run by Katie of Inside Number 23. And that I had just started. I'd put in a full day's work and completed the yoke. It's a top-down raglan sweater. But I also had my Coda, which is a huge oversized sweater by Brooklyn Tweed, um, from Brooklyn Tweed. It's by Olga Barrera Kafelian. I do my best. Um, so that's a huge sweater that I had started right at the beginning of November and then dropped off of at Thanksgiving, which if you don't know, American Thanksgiving is like November 26th-ish. It, it varies. Um, and hadn't picked up yet. And it is now January, you know, because Christmas knitting and all that stuff. So I was really, really feeling like I wanted to get back to my sweater. And I was, I was struggling with the decision there. So what I ended up doing is I put in that one day where I cast on and I did the whole yoke of the Miette. And that really got me confident and feeling like, okay, I've done a chunk of this. I'm going to finish this on time. I now kind of have the permission. I felt like it was okay to then set that aside and really focus on the Kodo, which was my sweater. So... I actually haven't touched them yet since that day when I cast on and I showed it to you. And I have barely knit on anything except for the Kodo since then. So I have wonderful, exciting progress to show you. I'm almost finished with it. And I do want to spend some time in this episode since I haven't knit on a ton of things, a ton of different things. I want to spend some time sort of talking a little more in depth about the Kodo and my experience with it but I've also got a really big stash enhancement for you later, and I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about my um, Hexapuff stash of yarns that I've curated specifically for my beekeeper's quilt. So those will be some fun little extra segments later to help uh, fill it out. I think it's gonna be a fun episode. So, jumping into the um, Kodo, here's what I'm working on right now. It is the first sleeve, and I have finished the body, 
which I will show you. So now I just need to do both sleeves and then pick up and knit the neckline um, and seamlessly join the shoulders. So here's the body. <laughs> I swear to God, every time I look at it, it's like an entire blanket. And I think, whose idea was it to knit an oversized sweater? Like, what kind of crazy person thinks, I know, I know what would be a fun sweater to knit. The one that takes 10 skeins of yarn. The one that has eight inches of positive ease. That's a really great idea. <laughs> like. All joking aside, it's a, it's been a fun knit and I, this is definitely, it's been a fun knit, but it's definitely more of a um, product knit for me, but I am very, very excited about the product and the actual knitting itself has been fun. So I would definitely recommend it. It's been great. So here you have the shoulders. This is the front. You can see the neckline here. It's just on my, um, so big because I had the entire sweater on this one before. Um, so that's just my cable for my interchangeables. You have a weird array of <laughs> mismatched um, junk yarn and cables and lots of fun stitch markers. I mean, the chaos of this sweater is really something to behold. So here's everything up at the neck and I just think it looks really cool the way the neck shaping worked out here, you can see. All of these short rows keeping with the articulated rib um, just to just all the little details of making it exactly the shape you want it to be and and down at the bottom you can see as well these short rows creating that lovely detail and on the back you can see it and it's got that nice little high-low hem so I had knit on this semi-monogamously for like three weeks, and then I picked it up about a week ago and knit um, very monogamously. The only other thing I've knit on this week is my Wildflower and Honeycomb socks, and I'll show you I haven't gotten very far. And I only knit on them um, one night when we had people over for game night, which I honestly didn't get much knitting done at all because we were mainly playing games where you had to pay attention the whole time. Um, but I did, I did that and I also took it to dinner and to lunch a couple times and just knit very slightly while I was waiting for the food to come. Again, not very much, a little bit in the car, but we live in the city. So like the car trip is like three minutes. <laughs> um, so, uh, I basically, that was my sort of like portable, um, you know, knitting project, but everything else was the Kodo. So to give you an idea of the time it takes to, to do one of these, although it is huge. I really only spent about four weeks knitting on it and not monogamously. Um, and it's it's a lot. So this is a worsted weight. It is Brooklyn Tweed's Shelter. And it recommends a US 7 needle, but I am using, I'll put in what that is. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I'll put the metrics um, on the screen. So it recommends a size seven. I'm using a size six. I actually went down just the first time that I made a swatch and I got gauge on the first swatch. And the reason that I went down is because I just know my own knitting and I tend to have a slightly loose gauge, I find. So this is my swatch, which I washed in the washing machine in a delicate bag in cold water and then um, dried flat. And if you look at the swatch next to the fresh knitting, you can tell that although the dimensions are not much different, the actual sort of tightness of the stitching, like it does definitely tighten up a bit. So what I've done and what I would recommend to anyone to do, I don't know, maybe this is just standard best practices and you already know, but I certainly had never had anyone tell me, I just kind of figured it out for myself, that when you're knitting in the pattern and it says, you know, do this until it measures uh, six inches from this point, I wouldn't actually measure the six inches on this. 
what I would do instead was count the number of rows and go up against what it said that should be in gauge. So the gauge for this particular pattern is that four rows, which is also one articulated rib because you have three rows of knits and then a purl bump row. So basically every time you have a rib, that should be an inch. And it's pretty much an inch when you measure it here, but it's actually more accurate here. So I just found that counting the rows themselves instead of using measuring tape would be more accurate. If I just made sure to do that every single time, I feel that that's my best way to, once it's actually blocked and I'm wearing it, um, get the dimensions that the designer had in mind. So that's what I'm doing with that, and um, I think it's I think it's going to work out pretty well and, and keep me consistent. I also honestly found that because I was lucky enough to have this four stitch rib, it might be different if I were just doing stockinette and counting the rows might be a little bit more of a headache, but because counting the rows wasn't that hard, I found that's actually easier than measuring because I don't always have a measuring tape with me and um, I can always count my rows. So I, I kind of felt like I know I'm being more consistent, I know I'm not stretching it, I don't have to have measuring tape. I just found that counting the rows instead of literally measuring is a really good way to go there. And I do like it when a pattern actually tells you the number of rows instead of um, inches or centimeters or whatever, just because I think it does tend to be more accurate, but if you know what your gauge is, you can translate from it. So that was one thing I wanted to talk about with this. Another thing I wanted to mention is just sort of, if you're thinking about knitting this sweater, any of the techniques that um, you're gonna need. So without giving too much about a way about how the pattern works, um, you know, there's some short row shaping. It involves twin stitches, which uh, you will be familiar with if you've ever done the fish lips kiss heel. Um, and, you know, the texture is just knit rows interspersed with purl rows, so that's really easy. I honestly find this to be such a more pleasurable kind of rib to knit because instead of pulling the yarn forward for your purls and then straight back on the same row, you're just doing an entire purl row. So I find that it's like a much faster knit than if you're doing like a traditional rib. Obviously it doesn't serve the same purpose as a traditional rib, so it's not like you can substitute it for like your, the cuff of a sock or something, um, but I just thought that would be worth um, mentioning that it for a texture, this goes really fast. And then um, the, the most complicated part, I think personally, is the facing, which I, I couldn't figure out what to call this when I was talking about it last time. I kept calling it that pico edging like thing because <laughs> it reminds me of how you create a pico edging where you start here, you sort of knit the facing and then you knit the rest and then you join them together. And um, like I said, I don't want to give away too much of the pattern, but you know, just to give you a general idea, it involves a provisional cast on, which um, if you've never done that, you use scrap yarn. And then at a certain point, you're going to have to pick up your stitches from the provisional cast on on another needle. So you're going to have two different needles and you're going to have to fold them up and sort of join them in a three needle situation. So um, none of that is something that you can't figure out how to do but it can be a little bit fumbly. It's not the most fun part of the pattern to do, but it does create this really, really gorgeous edge. There's just absolutely no way I would ever skip it. And it's the kind of edge that I feel like I might even apply to other patterns in the future if they don't have something um, that I like as much. So on the sleeve, it has the facing as well, and the neck will also have the facing. And uh, I can't tell you how excited I was to start the sleeve because one thing about knitting this huge oversized sweater is once you're like on the shoulder part, right? And you're like turning it and knitting back and forth, back and forth, and you've got all of this hanging off, like it's a little burden burdensome. Um, obviously, I think knitting a sweater all in one piece or mostly in one piece is so much more convenient than having to seam. But having a huge thing falling off your needles is can be a little bit, 
I mean, it's fine, but it, it definitely was a relief when I started the sleeve and all of a sudden it was like, I could easily carry it around with me. I just didn't, I just didn't have to fuss about it. I could uh, have my cat sitting in my lap while I knit and I didn't have to worry about getting my knitting all up in his face and you know, all that good stuff. So that is the Koto. I am hopeful and I do believe that I will have it finished so that I can wear it for you next week when I do the podcast. Um, next week I am going uh, on a couple days um, little retreat to a cabin with my husband for our third wedding anniversary, which is our eighth anniversary of when we met. Um, so I really would like to take it with me. And so that is my my motivation. So I'm probably going to stay relatively faithful to it this week as well. And, um, you know, if I do, if I do finish it, hopefully I finish it with a few days to block it so that I'm not having to worry about whether it's drying in time or whatever, because it is huge. Um, and then in that time I can get some other knitting done. So we'll see. But I'm very, very excited to show you the finished object and to have it myself. And I will just show you this as well. I don't think I've shown you this before. This is what I'm keeping it in. It's um, it's like a canvas type bag from Society6. It's got uh, Harry Potter books obviously on it. So um, you know me, I'm always throwing together various bags that aren't technically project bags. I don't really mind using um, things like this. So that's what I have the Kodo in. And I have, oh, I'll give you this idea. So the size I'm knitting, which is the 48 inch bust um, for a size 40 measurement bust um, on, on your person, 48 inches for the um, for the sweater itself, which if you can believe it, is not even close to the largest size it comes in. <laughs> There's two larger sizes. So it calls for 10 skeins and I bought 11 just in case. Um, so the sort of partial skein that you saw on the sleeve and these are what I have left. So I am hoping that I don't even get to this one and I can use it for hat. Um, so if that gives you an idea of how close I am to being finished, uh, these are just 50 gram skeins of worsted. So it's like 142 yards, something like that. I hope I'm not way off with that. Um, I feel like that's what it is, but. Who knows? And I also decided, I talked before that I want to do the seams in a different yarn um, just because the yarn is uh, so soft. And so this is the Thunderhead Tonal Knit Picks that I used for my husband's socks. Isn't it so pretty? Um, so I put this in my project bag as well because I decided that's what I want to seam with. Just because it's really the easiest gray that I have lying around the house. Um, at first I thought maybe I would need a worsted to seam, but then I read on Ravelry that some other people had used sock yarn, so um, I feel good about that. So that is my big work in progress, my other works in progress to show you. Um, I do want to just check in on them yet. Um, like I said, I haven't touched it since I showed you last, but we might have some new viewers who want to see it. Plus I realized I never showed you the picture. So this is the finished uh, photo, what it's going to look like. And I ordinarily wouldn't pick the exact same color yarn necessarily, but um, I do think the color is part of what made me notice it for my friend because this is very much her color. So there we have the yoke. So there's that, uh, just as a reminder, it is just Knit Picks Dishy, they're cotton worsted um, in Fiesta Red. And I have this in my ghastly project bag from Good To Be Girl. So like I said, I haven't touched them yet all week. Um, the one other thing I have touched besides the Kodo is my socks. It's just a Madewell tote, not tote, pouch. Um, this is the half object, 
that I showed you last week. Um, my little cookie there is from the Gnome Knitter. And this yarn, I'll show you what caked up, is Pink Punk, the colorway Pink Punk from Fiber Revolution on the Australis base, which is a four ply, uh, I wanna say 75.25. And so, as I mentioned, not very much done on this at all. There's the cuff, which is a three by one rib. And I've slightly just started the first row of eyelets. Um, which are gonna look like that. Yeah, so that's the only other thing I've touched and I barely touched it. But I am very excited about these socks and getting them off the needles. Um, but you know, I was just really, really feeling the Kodo and I'm glad that I stayed focused with it because I think I got a lot done. Um, if you ha hadn't seen last week, I would pretty much just split at the arms. So all of um, the top on both sides and the uh, sleeve is done. And I don't know, different people knit different amounts every week. For me, I feel like that's a good amount given that I was um, working all week and kind of working a little bit overtime and, you know, had a lot of other things on my plate. And so a lot of that got done on the weekend and just a little bit on the weekdays. But I, but I do knit every single day, even if it's just a little bit in the evening. So, okay, so that's all my whips. And now I want to talk briefly about On the Horizon before getting into my awesome stash enhancement and some hexa stash discussion. So I mentioned in my first episode that I have picked out some lovely Madeline Tosh for my Ashburn shawl, which I definitely want to finish or definitely want to cast on. Um, I'm holding off because I don't like having too many items going at once until I finish the Kodo. And then I think um, either that or a hat, or they might both go on at the same time, are gonna be next. So that's definitely coming up. I'm very excited about it. As far as hats, I mentioned last week that I don't really have um, a hand knit hat that I wear frequently. I have hand knit hats, but they, they all have, you know, none of them is like that perfect hat that I tend to wear like as my go-to hat. So I do have a list of ideas and ones that I might be starting soon. Um, the Mendia hat I mentioned, I have some stash yarn that could work for that. I'd like to do the Lolo by Jared Flood if I do have a full skein of the Brooklyn Tweed Shelter left over from the Kodo. Um, I'm thinking about a sugarcane hat for myself. So the sugarcane hat, if you didn't see it in my first episode, is this really lovely simple beanie that you knit by holding a strand of like a kid silk mohair type, really thin yarn, along with another fingering. And it creates just a very beautiful hazy halo. Um, and I have this kid silk in this pale pink color. I would tell you the exact colorway, but um, actually I might know it. Do I know it? <sighs> yeah, I do know it. It's Grace. It's called Grace. Um, I think this would be really, really pretty held with like a white or something just so that it was like a very faint pink color. I kind of like the idea of that. Um, and I also like the idea of doing just doing a black one, like a really classic black one. So I thought about that. And then today I saw on Instagram that um, Pearl Soho is giving away the pattern for their reversible pleat hat, which is a fun little stockinette hat. It has an interesting sort of um, construction to the decreases. And then it's actually reversible. You can turn it to the other side and you have your reverse stockinette 
and you have some contrasting color as like the seaming and a tiny little, not even pom-pom, but almost like a tiny little bit of fringe at the top. It's really cute. So I have no idea what yarn I would use for that, but um, that's just, you know, tickling my fancy lately. Yeah, so that is everything. Oh, well. We will also get into it in Stash Enhancement. I have uh, I have some Harry Potter yarns, and I've been thinking socks, shawls, hats, what exactly do I want to do with them? So I'm going to show you the yarn right now as we get into Stash Enhancement. Um, if you do not know, Katie of Inside Number 23 is running a year-long Harry Potter knit-along. Um, which is awesome. And I got on Etsy recently and ordered four Harry Potter colorways in sock yarn. Um, these are all from Little Bean Loves and they're all Harry Potter. And one of the cool things, sorry, get the rustling out of the way. One of the cool things about this is that I actually, can you tell that I, <laughs> I kind of tend to go for the same shades I'm a bit of a pink person. Um, what's neat about this is I actually got one on each of her sock bases. So I thought that would be cool to show you. So the first base is the Lux sock. This is an 801010 10, um, merino cashmere nylon. And this colorway is called Molly Weasley. So I think I really like the idea of this for socks just because it feels very luxurious to have cashmere socks. Um, I have heard that 801010s are not necessarily as um, sturdy, I guess, which makes me hesitate a little bit. Also the colors are so pretty, I feel like I would wear something like this in a shawl. So I'm not 100%, but that's my thought process there. Next up is the Simple Sock, which is her singles base. And this colorway is just so lovely. This is the Dirigible Plums. And if you can see, it's got these little bits of the dark plummy purple. But the peachy tone throughout, I feel like reminds me of the inside of a plum. So it's almost like little bits of the plum skin, all with this sort of fleshy plum color. Just gorgeous. And again, um, so this is 100% superwash merino. Because it doesn't have the nylon in there, I'm a little hesitant to do socks. I know it can be done. Um, I, I, and I don't have a problem with, with experimenting there. But also the yarn is so special that a part of me kind of would like it to be a shawl or something. I'm not sure if I can pull off that color that well, but I don't 100% care. Um, yeah, so I, I don't think I'd want it to be a hat, but so still thinking on that. This base is the Everyday Sock. So that is a 75-25 Merino Nylon. And it's coming off, I think, a little purple on camera. It's more of a mauve color. Um, the colorway is Hermione. So that's pretty funny, Hermione on an everyday sock base. <laughs> However, I am thinking more along the lines of a hat for this. And I really, I really haven't decided. I keep going back and forth. Um, but this just is such a lovely, lovely color. And finally, sparkle sock base. And this I know is going to be socks. This is actually the first thing I'm going to use because the colorway, um, oh, so Sparkle Sock is 7025 Merino Nylon Stellina. Um, and the colorway is Amortentia, which is the Harry Potter Love Potion. So I thought these would make a great February sock along with the Love Socks that I'm planning on doing for February. So I'm going to cast those on soon. I don't know if I want to do those first or the love sock first or maybe at the same time but I need to finish the wildflowers and honeycomb first. So I have one more skein of yarn and then I have some bags and stitch uh, project progress keepers. There it is. Progress keepers that I want to show you. Gosh you know you don't realize 
how hard it is sometimes to think of the right word until you film yourself. Oh, I never mentioned. I'm drinking blueberry. Wild blueberry? I want to say wild blueberry. It's the Celestial Seasonings blueberry tea. Um, herbal, unsweetened. Kind of like a raspberry zinger, but blueberry. I think it does have natural flavoring, whereas I think the raspberry zinger might just have raspberry leaves. I, I don't quote me on either of those facts. Anyway, I like Celestial Seasonings a lot because I grew up with it and um, it has my name in the title. So. This little baby is just a 50 gram fingering skein of the Koi Goo Painters Palette Premium Merino. And this colorway is, it's a number, 744. I was thinking about my Hexapuffs and um, I watched the video of Tiny Owl Knits um, showing her Beekeeper's Quilt and talking about the project for the first time, which is like years old, back when the pattern came out. And um, she was showing how she likes to knit a lot of them in the koi goo. And how with the koi goo, it sort of shows up as little individual stitches, different colors, and almost gives you like that fair isle effect. And um, although I had not initially conceived of my Hexapuff um sort of stash uh, involving a ton of variegated and lots of bright colors or anything, I realized that if I went if I went and found a koi goo that was sort of in that color story that I had started to create with my stash, that it would actually be really, really fun. And I, I didn't want every single um, hexapuff to be variegated I wanted to have some solids to sort of show off the shape of the hexagons themselves and um, keep some subtlety in there but I realized that I really would like a little bit of koi goo in there so I ordered that specifically for my stash um, which we will be getting to in just a second my sort of curated hexa stash of yarns but first a uh, couple other things that I added to my stash. So speaking hexapuffs, this is a pouch that I got from Society6 to keep my hexapuff situation in. So actually my stash of hexapuff yarn is in this, feeling super fine, which is a Knit Picks bag. But I wanted something, that's sort of where I keep all the yarns that I've, I've dedicated to the project. I wanted something that I could have as my sort of on-the-go um, project bag for the Hexapuffs. So there's a um, Ziploc of polyfill in here, my lavender. Um, the only reason the lavender isn't God, it smells so good. The only reason the lavender isn't in a uh, Ziploc is because I just ran out of Ziplocs, so I, I found this and put it in there. So that's the method to my madness. Um, oh, I was gonna show you. Lavender. Yum. Um, and this is from an Etsy shop. I honestly do not remember because I got it a long time ago, but um, so I apologize for that. If you are curious, just ask me in the comments and I'll look it up for you. So I have those. I have my um, DPNs, which these are just some random DPNs. I honestly don't even know. I just found them somewhere. Um, and my pattern, which if you are unfamiliar, here it is. There you can see her cat sleeping on it. Um, the lovely, lovely beekeeper's quilt that consists of all these yummy little hexapuffs all just quilt tied together absolutely love 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 so that's my little hexapuff project bag that I've finally put together for myself the way that I want it 
and it definitely I think helps to have something special for it picked out with that in mind. So because my color story is sort of neutrals and pastels, I just loved the idea of a project bag that has hexapuffs in pale colors. Very, very cute. And then while I was at it, I got another pouch from Society6. And this is for all my Harry Potter projects. And in it right now, I put Harry Potter progress keepers that I just got from um, Nindy by Nature. So th actually, this is the one that I ordered. It's a, see? It's a snitch and it's done with like a little jingle bell, which I just think is so cute. So I ordered that and then she threw in the lightning bolt as well, which is very nice. So I will use these just to keep myself in that Potter mood while I work on my Potter projects. Okay, so that's Stash Enhancement and now I am very pleased to talk a little bit about my Hexapuff, um, my sort of curated Hexa stash, if you will. So as I mentioned, this bag is from um, Nipix, and I think it's so cute, feeling super fine. And I thought it was perfect for keeping these yarns in because they're all um, fingering weight, AKA one, AKA super fine. The first thing in here is the um, kip silk haze in the grace that I mentioned I wanted to use for that hat. Um, it'll only use one of these at the most. Uh, I just happen to have both of these sitting around in stash left over from an ill-fated project a long time ago <laughs> that never worked out. Um, and it was actually it was actually an attempt at a sweater. Um, that I started but I had never checked for gauge and so about halfway through I realized it was a bad idea and um and I ended up just scrapping the whole thing um so anyway these uh she recommends God, I keep saying she I can't believe I can't think of her name right now um let me just look it up Stephanie Stephanie I'm a big fan um Stephanie Dosen who is Tiny Elements so she did she she designed the beekeeper's quilt and um she recommends using kids okays holding it uh doubled sorry i'm looking for my puffs oh here they are um so this is the the one that i've done with the kids okays and it's actually you can see a little bigger so that's fine. I'm not going to like throw it out or anything. Um, you can also see the lavender through it. I just think my gauge was too loose on this for some reason. I just need to pull tighter and I think I will get something closer in size to this. So I'm not going to throw this one out. I don't really mind having some imperfect ones in there. It's fine. It's not like it's huge. But um, if you're doing this yourself, I would recommend if you're holding the Kid Silk Haze double, to match fingering weight, uh, make sure your tension is is a little tighter than with the others. So I just wanted to give you an idea. I just brought in some of my puffs um, and give you an idea of what they look like with this yarn. So both of these are from um, the, gosh, I'm a mess. Nipix Chroma Fingering. This one is Drawing Room, and this one is Fog Bank, and I'll show you in the skein. Actually, I don't have Fog Bank in the skein because I gave it to my sister-in-law because she wanted to knit some puffs for me. Um, but this is a different chroma color. This is Sandpiper, and this is actually Drawing Room. So as you can see, this is what I got from this. So it obviously does not include all of the colors in there. It's really mostly blue with a little bit of the purple coming in right here. Um, whereas like this one, the gray sort of travels more further down it before it gets into this color. So it really just depends on where you start and stop. Uh, you can get a lot of different stuff going on there. 
which I think is fun. I really like the idea of using the chromas for the um, hexapuffs because it does give you some interesting variety in the shades. And I actually just started doing that because I happened to have the drawing room in my stash and I didn't really know what I wanted to do with it. But then I liked the effect so much that I went and I bought the sandpiper in the fog bank. This is the sandpiper. This is the fog bank. Um, specifically to add to my hexa stash. Um, yeah, so I think I think those are fun. And then I will say also, my puffs, as you can tell, they're not all super perfect. Um, these are, of course, some of the first ones I think I'm going to get more consistent as I continue making them. But also, I'm uh, going to change up how I do it a little bit. So for these, I did the cast on that she recommends. That's here. And then I did a three needle bind off, which is what she recommends here. And I've decided that what I would like to do instead is a Judy's Magic cast on and a Kitchener stitch to give it more of a seamless look uh, instead of having these sort of edges. Just because I don't think that the other sides so much have that ridge look and I don't, I don't like it being just on the top and bottom. I'd like them to look to not be as obvious where you cast on and where you cast off and everything. So that's what I'm going to do from now on. But again, I don't care as far as tossing out the ones I've already made. Um, that's fine. And I don't even know. I told my sister-in-law that that's what I'm doing, but I also told her she doesn't have to if she wants to just follow the pattern. So I might have um, the hex puffs that she makes for it might be that way as well. So we'll see. I do like the idea of her uh, joining in and doing some of them because... I think that kind of makes it special to have um, little bits that someone else has made for you. So then the rest of my uh, stash, so the, the uh, chromas were sort of where it started. And then I had this these sitting around and I thought, well, I'll throw those in there because they match the palette. And also, um, Stephanie had specifically recommended Kids LK's Held Double. And then the other stuff, um, well, this was also just sitting around in my stash and I have no idea what it is. It's kind of like a Kitzel case, but it's a little thicker. I think it is Rowan, but it might have a different name. If you can see, here's the Kitzel case. Here's this. It's just a little thicker. Um, so I don't know what the heck it is, but I think it'll, it'll go well. Not held doubled, just held regular. And then at that point, I have a couple things that are leftovers that I thought worked perfectly. So, you know, you've seen my palette with these pinks and purples and grays and blues. Both of these are Knit Picks Alpaca Cloud Fingering. This was the one that I held with the Kid Silk Haze for um, the sugar cane hat that I knit for my sister-in-law. And this is the tiny little bit that's held left over from the uh, Ivy Trellis mittens that I did for the Never Not Knitting Swap. So this one is Charlotte and this one is Anna. All of them have nice names that are um, sort of Austin-esque or Bronte-esque. I like that. Uh, so yeah, I think these colors work really well and Obviously, they're the right weight and they have a nice little bit of a halo. I think they're going to fit in really well. I just love the idea of having a variety of textures all in the same color palette. And I think some people, they knit their beekeeper's quilt with more of an idea of a variety of colors, but similar textures, and I'm kind of going the other direction. Um, and then I have my leftover Bergère de France Gumi 50 in en plomb beige, um, which is from my sugar plum socks. I actually have almost an entire skein left over. And then I actually have a whole other skein because for some reason, even though I only needed two skeins, I bought three. I honestly don't know what was going on in my brain that day. So I need other things to use this lovely yarn in. I think baby socks would be good. Um, but I think it might, I think it might be nice for the hexapuffs. I'm curious to see how many stripes fit on a hexapuff and whether you get some of that 
situation going like with the chroma where you're just getting part of the story and then another hexapup is bringing like another part of that yarn story because that adds more variety which I think is really nice um, more variety of all still telling the same kind of story and the last thing I have in here is um, Nipix Hawthorne fingering and confetti speckle so here's my shame <laughs> Back when I decided I wanted to do the ha the um, wildflowers and honeycomb socks, I bought this for it. I then discovered that this was not enough yarn. I would need to buy two. And I ended up buying two in birthday cake speckle. This is confetti speckle. Birthday cake speckle is very similar. You saw the beginning of my wildflowers and honeycomb socks knitted up in that in my first episode before I decided that it was too speckly for the eyelets and ripped it out and restarted it in Fiber Revolution um, Pink Punk colorway. So literally, <laughs> I went through three different yarns trying to find the right yarn for those dang socks. Um, and this is not even enough for a pair of socks. It's just one. So what I'm going to do is use the Birthday Cake Speckle probably for Hermione's Everyday Socks or something else that can hold up to how speckly it is. And then this, I think is going to be good for hexapuffs. I'm a little concerned that it's too colorful. But there are lots of other colors in here. It's just, um, I just want to keep that sort of pastel look. And I think the, the cream base is going to allow me to do that. So um, if it gets to be too many hexapuffs, out of this, then I'll just try to keep the hex pups to a minimum and kind of spread them out so that there's not too much going on. But I do think that's going to work well. But I have not actually done a puff in it yet, so I don't have a super clear idea of what it looks like in puff form. Um, yeah. So uh, the last, the last little bit on the hexa stash is um, the pink punk. I believe I will probably be using some of these leftovers for it. I just think it's probably perfect. Um, it is gonna be quite a pink blanket. I like pink, as you can see. But I also think this would make a really, really cute pair of baby socks as well. So, um, you know, that, that barely takes any yarn. I think I'm gonna have leftovers enough to do some baby socks and, um, and a puff or two or a bunch. So yeah, and, and honestly, whatever I have left over of uh, these colors, I think would make good hexapuffs as well. So as you can see, I tend to gravitate toward a kind of color palette that works well together. So whether I'm specifically picking things for the hexapuffs themselves, um, which actually I guess at this point this and the other chroma and the koi are the only things I've bought specifically for the hexapuffs. I have relegated this to be just hexapuffs, but it was already in my stash. Um, so whether I'm buying things specifically for the hexapuffs or sort of repurposing old yarn, I find that it's not very difficult to fit it into that palette that I have in my mind. And I'm really, really excited <laughs> about how they're all gonna to look together. I think it's just such a fun project and it's one of those things that is very product and process focused because I love the idea of the final blanket, but at the same time, I'm in no rush to finish it because I'm really enjoying the process and I really would like there to be a lot of those little leftover bits that I remember what they're from, almost like a cozy memories blanket although with the color palette being a little more, bit more curated than um, just sort of the uh, anything goes kind of thing that um, might be more suited to a cozy memories blanket. And with that in mind, uh, I guess the last thing I wanna mention is just blankets in general. So obviously so many other people with their podcasts are knitting cozy memories blankets and a lot of people are crocheting the stripe um, blankets with their scraps. And I really like um, I really like those projects. I love seeing them and seeing people add on little bits of leftovers. 
Obviously, I have a lot of fun repurposing my leftovers into hexapuffs or Christmas ornaments or baby socks or whatever the case may be. And um, right now, I feel good with my Beekeeper's Quilt being the only blanket pro project that I have going because I'm very into it. And I don't have a ton of leftovers or mini skeins that don't suit it. But I do really like the idea of a scrappier, less curated collection that can really use any kind of fun minis you get from people or any kind of leftovers you have. And I do think I would like to do a Cozy Memories blanket at some point um, in, in that style where it's more of an anything goes. I'm, I'm looking to the colors and I'm matching them up where I think they might look nice, but um, the color plan palette is much more broad. I'm not a big crocheter, and so I didn't think I would be interested in the crochet stripe blanket, which I know everyone says, and then they try it and they get totally addicted. And recently I started to think what might be fun for me if I were to do something like that is an actual uh, chevron striped blanket. So basically it's the same as the crochet stripes, but you actually do a little bit of shaping to make them take a zigzag. Um, I just think that would add a little bit of interest to uh, the way that the blanket itself looks. And I think it would go well with having a ton of different colors in there. I think it could almost give it a bit of a Missoni sort of look. Um, and that would be an, enough of something else going on with those zigzags to kind of make it look scrappy, but like elevated scrappy, right in that place that I think could be really cute. So in the back of my mind, I have both of those happening. Although right now I'm very, um, excited about just the beekeeper's quilt and that's where my focus is. So that's going to be our show for today. I really hope that you enjoyed it. Um, make sure that you join the group on Ravelry, like this video, uh, give it a thumbs up, help other people find it. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't yet. Leave me comments introducing yourself, asking questions, add me on Ravelry, follow me on Instagram, blah, 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 all that stuff. <laughs> um, and once again, just huge, huge, huge thank you. Huge thank you from the bottom of my heart for watching this and engaging and um, being the other person on the other end of this for me to talk to because um, I just, I'm just thinking about knitting all the time and I just, <laughs> I just want to talk to somebody about it. Um, so it's been really fun to start this podcast and to see uh, an audience very slowly but surely build. Um, so there's not very many of you out there right now, but I see you and I appreciate you and I'm so happy you're there. Um, so share it, keep watching it. Let me know if there's anything else you wanna see and uh, don't forget to you know get involved in whatever way you wanna get involved, joining the group or asking questions or anything like that. I'm so happy to have you here. So I guess that's all for me. Um, I will see you next week when I will hopefully be wearing my Kodo sweater. Let's hope. Um, and I hope that you have a lovely, lovely week filled with knitting and crocheting and anything else that makes your heart happy. Bye.